thanks for joining us, and particularly Honourable Minister, good to see you again. Or, and just for context, um, two years ago, Bloomberg did an event on the potential for Africa, and I had the minister join me um, back then virtually, and I was really glad to finally have this session in person. And Thank I wanted to sort of, sort of start with you and you know, open this panel up. And I talked about $3 trillion. And um, unfortunately, I was not in the green room, but the bird whispered in my ear that when I mentioned $3 trillion, you were very excited about it. And clearly, Ghana wants to have a share. Ghana has got lithium. Ghana has got manganese. I'm even told Ghana has graphite, Ghana has iron ore. But look, over the last 100 years, Ghana has had history with mining and not so much to show for in terms of industrialization and other factors. So, Honorable Minister, why would they be different this time? Well, thank you very much. And first of all, let me thank Bloomberg and your audience for having us here uh, and to discuss this very consequential matter, uh, in which clearly, as you quite rightly articulated in your presentation, has a, a lot of bearing on, on the future prospects of Africa and my own country, Ghana. You are right, Ghana has been a big mining country uh, over the years, for a century now. We're actually called the Gold Coast, and it's also a good reason why we refer to as the Gold Coast, because uh, we have a lot of gold, a lot of resource, mineral resources. As a matter of fact, today, Ghana has been named the leading producer of gold in Africa, with overtaking South Africa. I thought that deserved a round of applause. <laughs> But I think that um, the story shouldn't end there, which is why your question is very important and fundamental. How do we benefit from these resources? And I don't refer to only Ghana, I refer to the whole of the African continent. Over the years, the truth is that we've not positioned our economies and the industry in a manner where we will benefit optimally. Yeah. Now, in Ghana, we have a completely different paradigm shift. We have a paradigm shift where We've uh, jettisoned the age-old um, regime of the exportation of raw materials, raw minerals. From 2017, our president, President Akufuado, has come up with a new policy framework, which is meant that we are taking systematic steps to retain the highest end of the value chain in our country. I think it's always important when we discuss this to be realistic. Yep. It cannot happen overnight. From 11 billion to 7 trillion, yep. you have to accept your realities yep. and you have to accept the challenges you have to overcome to be able to ultimately reach the highest end of the value chain. But it takes a couple of interventions, in my view. One is policy. You have to put in place the policy framework which is why the president, for example, through uh, various acts of parliament, have uh, put in place this framework, which is meant, for example, that in the case of bauxite, um, we've passed a law which indicates that within a certain period of time, you cannot export that resource in its raw form. Mm. We've done the same for iron ore, the very much sought after lithium, which is very important for the green energy transition. We, are, we have a policy before the cabinet, as I speak to you now, which is going to ensure that we retain, uh, not the highest end, I don't think we can retain the highest end at this time, but at least retain a significant proportion of the value chain in country. That is number one. Number two. So Minister, just to confirm, Ghana is planning a policy to retain value for lithium. That is country. correct. And as I said, the policy before the cabinet now, the cabinet is... Um, um, expected to discuss it at this next meeting on the 29th. We are not committing ourselves to lithium in any form or shape. The idea is that we should put in place the policy first okay. and announce it to the international investor community. So everybody knows, if you are coming to Ghana to partner with the Ghanaian people and their government in the exploitation of our lithium resources or green minerals generally, this is our policy. Indeed. And, and at the heart of that policy is to say that as much as possible, we retain a significant proportion of the value chain. And if you want to hear me loud and clear, under no circumstance will we export our lithium resources in their raw form. We will not. Indeed. Or export our green minerals in their raw form. <laughs> so in conclusion, uh, Thank you. in conclusion, I mean, I think that there is a real genuine effort to uh, chart a new path, chart a new path to ensure that we have beneficiation 
of our mineral resources in country. Yes. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Minister. And just before I actually come to you on the same question, actually, um, so just to begin, I mean, for those of you who don't know, Bloomberg is a great organization. And um, the reason why I say this is that we've got this program where high schoolers can come in the office and shadow what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. And last week, Friday, I had the pleasure of a high school student joining me, and I was trying to tell her what I'm going to do today. So I showed her the panel, and she sees Joseph, and she sees your name. She said, oh, she's Ugandan. I'm Ugandan, <laughs> too. And she was absolutely inspired by you. So I did wanted to let you know that. But then I also made a promise to her that I would allow her to ask the first question to you. And this is what Malaika said. Dear Josephine, I can see you are an oil and gas person. What are you doing on a metals panel? <laughs> That's an excellent question. And, and again, it's always a privilege to be part of any Bloomberg conversation. And the reason I'm, I usually end up on a metals panel is tied to you know, the point the Honorable Minister said, which is really important. This sector doesn't, we don't see those outcomes. Those amazing numbers don't happen without good leadership and policy. And Ghana is clearly demonstrating that there's leadership and there's policy. Then the piece that comes next mm -hmm. ties into one of the points you raised, infrastructure, mm -hmm. right? And infrastructure today, if we want to industrialize and drive up infrastructure, we need energy. Mm -hmm. And this sort of ties into the broader energy debate then, which has been discussed on many different panels. For energy, we need investment. Um, and in the current green age that we're in, and this tension with traditional existing energy, transitioning to new energy sources, the reality is, and I'm, I always say this and I qualify that I'm an optimist, but the reality is the, the time it will take to transition, particularly across sub-Saharan Africa, is going to be longer than other parts of the world. And so traditional energy sources, oil and gas, is still going to be needed, particularly gas, if we want to industrialize in the short to medium term. And that industrialization feeds into manufacturing, which allows us to start, as the minister rightly put, building our way through that journey. We're not going to leapfrog to the EV market. So but just to hold you there, so yeah. are you saying that countries should focus on um, gas rather than clean energy? It doesn't have to be an either or. Indeed. That's the point. And I, and I feel we've made it an either or. It can be, I, I think it's the, um, the CEO of ADNOC put it rightly, we don't have to say it's this or this or this. We can say it is solar and wind and oil and gas. Yes. And, you know, we... Yeah, we I know a few people who would not be happy with that. But they may not be happy, but let's talk about reality. Okay. Right? And until I see a technology advance that allows solar and wind to give the thermal heat power we need to run mines and to do industrialization, and we're all hoping for those technology sort of leaps, the reality is the f traditional fuels we have today, particularly in markets that need to industrialize fast, we need traditional energy sources. And, and just to qualify that, you know, when I ran the National Oil Company, when you come later in the game, you can do it better. We put policy that we didn't do flaring. We made sure we followed all the IFC standards on um, nature and social impact. So there's ways to do it better that we can learn that still has less impact on the environment Indeed. as in parallel we do the green transition. Yeah, and um, for the context, I think Josephine used to be the CEO of the Ugandan oil company. Yeah. Yeah, so Minister, I think um, Josephine has sort of set the pace for us. But before I come to you, maybe to the audience, if you're inspired by the first round of questions and you want to join the conversation, there should be a QR code that pops up behind me. Please put your questions there. I've got an iPad, and you'll be part of this conversation. So, Minister, just we talked about infrastructure. And I think, um, obviously, once you move into the bulk minerals, infrastructure begins to play a key role. And I sort of started looking into some numbers. And if you take Ghana as an example, according to the World Bank, um, we've got about 947 kilometers of railways um, compared to, say, South Africa which is about 20,000 kilometers of rail lines, according to the World Bank. And I think Ghana has done tremendously well with the precious metal space, where obviously you don't need ball carriers. But then if we are to sort of become the number one for manganese and other minerals, infrastructure like rails will play a critical role. How do we bridge that gap? Well, absolutely. Um, but but I, I go back to um, my pet subject, which is policy. Because in all that you do, you must have a master plan. 
And um, President Akufuado and his government have put in place a very ambitious master plan with linkages. It's absolutely important. So the question you ask is key. You cannot build uh, a mining industry which is fit for purpose if you don't have the requisite infrastructure. So rail in particular is important. Not so much road infrastructure. I think when it comes to minerals, we're essentially talking about rail infrastructure. Now, until 2017, when President Akufuado took over the reins of governance, our country did not have a ministry of railway. He found it so necessary, so important to the realization of this master plan I talk about. And so today, we have a Ministry of Railway Development, which ministry is dedicated to building that requisite railway which will support our industrialization master plan. I think it's important. And that industrialization master plan has linkages to the automobile industry. And again, for the first time, Ghana is building an automobile industry. Volkswagen is in Ghana. Sinotrack is in Ghana. The, uh, several others have set up assembly plants in Ghana. So you have the automobile industry, you have the railway on, going on. You need an effective port system. Yep. This is why we are modernizing and expanding our port infrastructure. Yep. That is key. That is absolutely important. You also need various institutions to support your infrastructure drive, which is why we have um, an agency, a fund called the Minerals Income Investment Fund, where we are aggregating all our royalties to be able to push our infrastructure development. And we have an infrastructure fund itself, the Ghana Infrastructure Fund. But above all, and, and, and I think that that is a, is a fan up uh, contribution I make on this particular subject, but in my view, quite important, is also the, uh, the role, the very important role of the private sector. Yeah. And by the private se sector, I mean domestic as well as international private sector, international investors. We need to create the conducive environment to attract investors into our country. Mm. And there are a gamut of measures, a gamut of policies we've put in place which will attract investors. Rule of law, good governance, certainty and consistency. You know, the sanctity of contracts, very important. Change of government should not change contracts, should not change contractual rights. Governments don't wake up over, overnight and change the rules in the middle of the game. When you go to the judiciary, you must have a fair hearing you must have justice. All of these tenants of a democratic country are key to attract investment. Indeed. And I, I conclude by making my, um, a point I enjoy to make the most. And, and I, I, I make that point with a lot of pride as a Ghanaian. You should also as a Ghanaian. That oh. Ghana, Ghana is as democratic as any democratic country in any part of the world. The tenets of democracy are rooted in Ghana as they are rooted in England, as they are rooted in America, as they are rooted in Germany. We have a robust democracy. And I think that is our biggest trump card in attracting investors. Indeed. And I think um, <laughs> Thanks. Um, so obviously, democracy must yield results. And um, part of that is really the investment in people. And Josephine, I know um, you're very passionate, obviously, about skills development particularly in the youth, and um, I wanted to sort of bring you in here. It's important that if you're talking about transition, we have a transition that carries everyone along, and that would mean that the right skill set is not developed 10 years' time, but then it's developed today. If you look at the skills gap, so just this morning I was checking the, the world intellectual property has a ranking in terms of innovation, and um, most African countries score quite low. So to bridge that gap, we need to be innovative, but then how do we bridge the skills gap beyond just innovation. Another excellent point, and again, I'll, I'll build on what the Honourable Minister said, because what we found in slightly tangential sector, oil and gas, but when we set up policies around our oil and gas sector in Uganda, we first let even the skills gap and addressing skills be driven by policy. So we were very clear around um, right from the more sort of technical level, um, apprenticeship level, up to employment levels that companies have to make sure that there is local content, local employees to certain levels, and really setting targets through policy that then informed decisions at teaching levels, um, schools at university, People were then sent to very deliberate universities abroad to be trained, but it started with leadership and policy because good intentions can only get so far. So I, I think there's this recurring theme that if we want even to close the skills gap, we, we've talked endlessly about innovation, our youth, but if we're not deliberate, 
Um, as we are, you know, the minister is demonstrating really powerfully for Ghana, if you're not deliberate on policy on what you will do with certain minerals, if you're not deliberate on policy on the skills gap we need to fill and what, you know, quotas can have negative effects sometimes, but if they're deliberate and well thought through, we saw in the oil and gas sector in Uganda, when we set those numbers, people started to go to the right universities, the right technical colleges, we built some, they got training, but it was always under the umbrella of strong policy and, and regulation that directed those efforts. Yeah, and um, obviously, I'm just going to put you on the spot there. So if you can think, I just got a question. So there's a young person in there. What one skill should they focus on to be part of this transition? One skill. Look, it's, uh, there's all, I always get asked that question. And, I, and I, I always am slightly hesitant because by virtue of answering that, someone who may not be interested in that skill suddenly feels that they're left out, <laughs> right? And, and I don't ever want to Absolutely. deny anyone's dream. I would say there will be many different skill sets required. Some will be, very, and we used to talk about the direct skills that will be in mining and technical skills. Then there's the indirect skills, the service industry, legal, planning. There's so many aspects of this. And I think if we talk more in, are you interested in being directly involved in this market or indirectly involved based on your interests and what we did is we actually listed out different types of sectors and roles you could have so I think again building it back into policy recognizing there's going to be direct roles indirect roles making those as explicit as possible and letting people find where their connection is as opposed to spotlighting one or two roles and everyone feels pressured to take on one role even if they're not interested and that has a negative effect yeah and um just to add on to that, almost all my friends now are AI experts. A year ago, they were blockchain experts, so you're absolutely right. Um, Minister, I want us to pivot a little bit into something very important, sustainability. Mm -hmm. And I always say this tongue-in-cheek that I think you have the most difficult ministerial job in the world. Because on one hand, you have a portfolio that is meant to protect the land and forest of Ghana. And on the other hand, you have a portfolio that is supposed to dig up these forests and get the resources. And it's important that you do both well in order to do your job well. So when we put the spotlight on Ghana at the moment, how do you ensure that as demand for these metals grows and as such mining will grow, we do no harm to the environment? Well, that, that is, um, you're right, that, that is really the big conundrum, the big elephant in the room. And as you know, historically, the debate has been heated. You have the uh, strict environmentalists, uh, conservationists, who believe that don't touch anything, natural resource, just leave it there so we have our vegetation, we have our environment intact, and so on and so forth. Then you have those who also take the view that we need to exploit these resources for economic growth, development, and unleashment of prosperity. So that historical debate is a contest or the background on which we, we try to approach this particular uh, uh, situation. Now, in Ghana, uh, we have been very determined to adhere to the highest standards of ESGs, the environmental, social, and governance principles, and, and um, we, we, we take that very seriously. And so every aspect of the industry, we keep an eye on working to ensure that we promote the highest standards of ESGs. As you know, you, the SDGs enjoins us to develop sustainably. Uh, so whatever we do in, with our minerals and its exploitation, we need to ensure that we adhere to sustainability. Uh, a lot of measures have been put in place. I must admit, though, that we have real challenges on the ground, particularly in the area of artisanal small-scale mining. We still have difficulties. In Ghana, we call it Galamse. And it's a, it's a big issue for us. The government is trying to tackle it. Where we've not reached where we should be. But we are making the effort, and we are determined and confident that we'll be able to resolve that particular issue. Maybe I'll probably put you on the spot there. What are some of the measures the government are working on in terms of addressing the artisanal challenges there? Oh, a host of them, I mean, but fundamentally hinged on two policy pillars. One is reformation, which is reforming the sector, licensing regime, uh, getting them equipment for the extraction of the gold from the ore without the use of mercury. As you know, we are parties to the Minamata Convention and therefore we respect the dictates of the Minamata Convention. And then the enforcement regime, uh, deploying law enforcement to make sure that people are arrested and so on and so on. So we are making that effort. But my point is that, my fundamental point is uh, exploiting these mineral resources in a sustainable manner 
are not mutually exclusive. Yeah. I think that they can peaceably coexist. You can exploit the resources, and several countries have done so. I don't want to mention, uh, give examples, but I know of countries who, which, which have uh, gone about their mining sector and their mining industry in a manner which is also protected the integrity of the environment and the climate. Yeah. We can do all of that. My friend uh, Josephine uh, mentions the day we'll use uh, solar to mine and uh, use gas and all of that. These are all very ambitious technological interventions we can rely on. And Ghana is doing just that. Okay, great. Josephine, we're going to stay on sustainability, but I'm going to come from a different angle, right? And you know, 30, 40 years ago, if you had told anyone that the world would actually not be excited about oil anymore, many people will probably not believe you because it's so, in, it's so entrenched in our day-to-day -day life. But then the oil industry failed to adapt to where the world was moving in terms of sustainability, and now we found alternatives, which is batteries, right? So do you think that we could potentially hit that roadmap one day where people will wake up and go, like, you know what, we probably don't need the mining industry for this transition anymore as a result of their sustainability record. And what would it take for us to prevent that? So an excellent question that I want to come at in sort of two different ways. But just before that, I wanted to come back to your question to the Honourable Minister around this finding ways to balance um, mining with protecting conservation. And I think a piece to that is data. So when I put on my data scientist hat, there's a lot of systems now that allow you to analyze the earth, the environment, the biodiversity, soil health, so that the trade-offs can be understood with data in terms of we need to mine here, we need to conserve here. So I think that's a technology advancement that's really positive and helping key decision makers like the Honorable Minister to be able to make that trade-off with informed data. Then to your Immediate question. First, I want to actually sort of defend the oil and gas, and I will do that, and I may get All in right, trouble I'm for this. Enough. But, <laughs> but I, I do think that people don't appreciate that a lot of the cutting edge research and development that is going on in finding alternatives is coming through oil and gas companies. Are they perfect? No one is perfect, but there is a yeah, lot. Probably let me hold you there. So, are you saying the oil companies are developing the technologies? I think it's, it's not. I, I think often the work that they are doing is not often appreciated and recognized. Well, can and you, so, can you give me an example. No, I mean, any of the majors, I don't obviously like everyone else naming names, but any of the majors, you will find that there are huge departments looking at alternative fuels, alternative technologies, and investing significantly in those areas. I feel the more we us and them each other, we don't progress. Yeah. So I think it's acknowledging everyone is trying to get to the same end goal, coming at it differently and from a different legacy. And then to your sort of the follow on question, yes, we, you know, there was a point where it's like, is there an alternative to oil and gas? We now know there are alternatives. We know even battery technology is now advancing. What's really interesting is we're finding battery technology that's even moving away from minerals and saying, let's not even mine, let's go and use. Um, <laughs> uh, I know one company that's actually doing compressed air and recycled um, engines from cars and aeroplanes to create thermal energy to drive batteries with longer storage than lithium batteries. Yeah. So technology is moving, and I think we all have to be ready for that journey. Whether you're in oil and gas, whether you're in battery technology, we want the end goal. And so if we take away the us and them and actually focus more on partnering, collaborating, moving the needle on all fronts and recognizing mining has its problems and its challenges on an environmental water employment perspective. So every sector has to continually be looking at how can we do better and work together to do better. Indeed. And um, yeah, I think we can only go up from here in terms of doing it better. So I have a final question. I do get the privilege to travel around Africa a lot. And usually when I, whether it's a CEO of a company, a government official, or even an artisanal miner, there are two words they always ask me will this transition be just? So I wanted to sort of put the spotlight on both of you in one sentence, Honorable Minister. What does a just transition mean to you? Uh, well, it must be fair, it must be inclusive, and it must be just, <laughs> to use your words. <laughs> I know. The world must keep its commitment. Indeed. We, the, a lot of the discussions we're having today, fundamentally, where um, we've, be, we've been brought where we are, principally because of 
the historical developmental efforts of the developed world. Indeed. Africa altogether contributes 4% to emissions. My country, Ghana, will contribute 0.04%. The industrial revolution of the 18th century and the use of coal and the rest, which has got some people developed. Honorable what Minister, is we, are, where we, we are the sentence now. Yes, yeah, so, so <laughs> finally, I, I think that uh, you know, the commitments which were made in Copenhagen to contribute $100 billion a year for climate action, all of those must be fulfilled. But finally, finally, I want to submit that the Africa today is fundamentally different from the Africa 50 years ago. We tend to be too hard on ourselves. Africa is different. And if you want to see the difference in all humility and modesty, look at the three of us here. Ugandan, Ghanaian, Ghanaian. The African people, the Moroccans, are breaking uh, uh, boundaries, breaking glass ceilings, and doing things differently. And I have absolute confidence that over a period of time, Africa will pull through. And we have a, a, an energy transition which will be just, which will be fair, which will be inclusive, which will protect the vulnerable, and which will bring prosperity to the African peoples. Thank I have no doubt about that. Thank you. And uh, just Finn? <laughs> what is the gesture? It's usually, it's very hard to follow the minister. He's, he's so eloquent. Um, <laughs> next time I'll do the readings. <laughs> yeah, next time I'll. But no, I mean, for me, I summarize it in a just transition is acknowledging we're not starting this race at the same place. Yeah. And there are economies that have had 200, 160 year head start. Mm -hmm. And not only that, you've got a head start and we have a 600 million ton weight on our shoulders trying to run that same race. Mm -hmm. Because there's 600 million people today relying still on charcoal and firewood. So to assume that with that weight and a minimum 60 year up to 200 year lag, we are somehow going to get to the finish line at the same time in the same way, is where, what I call an unjust transition. Mm -hmm. And if we don't acknowledge that today there are needs that need to be met with existing solutions that can be done better while we run the race, the load gets lighter, we can move faster. Yeah. If we don't address that load of 600 million people struggling today, I've never seen a race where you get faster at the end. Uh, usually you get time. You're on your 15th sentence. I have to follow my honorable <laughs> minister. So, but yeah. All right, audience. <laughs> Acknowledging where we are, a fair and inclusive transition is what would deliver the just transition. And by this, I want to say thank you to the wonderful panelists, but then also thank you to you, the audience, for staying with us and being a big part of this. A round of applause for ourselves.